Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Here we see an as of yet unidentified classic PC. It's obviously a clone of some sort. And uh, how I came about to get this unit was uh, in the last episode we played around with the TRS-80 and uh, you may remember that I was using an older PC, a Pentium based PC with some disk utility routines utilizing DOS to make disk images for the TRS-80 and uh, that the problem with that was that the uh, PC the uh, the Pentium PC I'm referring to had a high density floppy drive in it and even though the utilities worked with it correctly it it was hit and miss to get disks made that read reliably on the uh, Radio Shack Model 3 which of course after thinking about it for a bit was obviously because of the magnetic strength being used and even though you can tell the utilities to only use uh, double density it still doesn't work right so the solution to that was to get a 360k half height well any kind of a 360k drive and then install that in the Pentium machine and use that to make reliable TRS-80 images so I spent some time on eBay looking for just drives, looking just like this. I prefer to get uh, TIAC drives because they, in my, I've had lots of TIAC drives in machines and they seem to work pretty well. So while looking for the drives, uh, basically untested drives go for about 40 to $50. Tested and guaranteed drives go $70 and up, which uh, was a bit which seemed a bit ridiculous for these drives. Now I know we, the things, things have changed and a lot of these drives have either disappeared or ended up in collector's hands, but that's kind of a lot of money, especially when you used to be able to buy these for a couple of bucks at a thrift store. So as I'm looking at this, finally, by chance, on eBay, I ran across this guy. And it was advertised as a PC compatible that powers up but does not generate any video. Period. So I looked at this and these suspiciously looked like TIAC drives. Now I know that's kind of a, a risky thing to do to try to identify drives by the way they look but uh, this was a single picture. It didn't really show a picture of anything else and uh, the seller made it pretty clear that uh, with his ad, it just looked like, hey, I just want to get rid of these things because old mystery PCs like this tend to run about $250 and up. And they're also described as powers up but doesn't do anything or this or that. So this one at uh, $69 seemed like a bargain, especially since shipping was included. And this guy is not light. I don't know what's inside of this, what it is. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to bring it up with a Variac because obviously the seller had turned it on, tested it, and basically determined that there was no video. Powers up, but no video. For what that means is uh, that essentially the power supply fan is running, and uh, you may see the drives doing seeks. And I don't even know if there's a hard drive in here or not, even though there's a hard drive light, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's one in there. And uh, so the first thing to do is, would be to open up this guy and see what it is that, that I've actually bought. And uh, it is a copy, I mean, <laughs> It's a copy of an XT or AT case. XTs usually have this whole front here open. So originally they had two full height floppy drives here. And then later on they had a full height floppy drive here and a hard disk sticking out over here also with a full height uh, front panel. So this actually looks more like an AT to me. But 
you never know because this is some sort of a clone. It does have a turbo button on it, which was uh, e uh, which was common to find on XT type machines. Uh, it has a lock and uh, a power light and a reset button. So looking at it a little closer, let's rotate this guy. It has a very PC early PC looking power supply with a huge paddle on the power uh, on the on off switch. It's generally in pretty good case in pretty good shape. The case is metal and the front part is plastic somewhat discolored over here. I don't know if that's dirt or if it's actually discolored by the sun. It does have a bunch of marker residue here and uh, some rust spots. And then uh, looking at the back, yes, it is heavy. It does, the power supply seems to extend all the way from here to here. It has the AC input and a, a female plug to put, uh, to plug a monitor into. And it looks like we have a pretty full complement of uh, cards here. Looks like, uh, Let's see, what could all of this be? So I don't know what this is. This looks like a serial port, a parallel port, a modem. And these two connectors, I don't know what they are. They kind of look like PS2 connectors, but they are not. They look more like Apple uh, serial uh, plugs, but we'll find out in a little bit. And then, of course, this must be the display card that has... Uh, CGA output over here and uh, I'm assuming that one of these is actually a composite output but I don't know right now so uh, let's see what awaits us. It is made in Taiwan. The trade name is Turbo, Turbo 10 and the model is a Datatech. It was actually advertised as a Datatech in the eBay but uh, I I don't recall ever hearing about data tech, so I don't know. There's a single screw on the back holding things together. And open sesame. Easier said than done. But here you go. We do have a hard drive. And uh, I guess it's the most important part. The most important part to me right now is remember the or original uh, reason for buying this was to see if these are 360K drives. And Removing a, a single screw on the side of the drive. Taking out the data cable and the power cable. And what do we have? So we have a TAG FD 55 BV. So I lucked out. They're identical drives. And the 55 BVs are double density, double sided drive. So these are 360K drives. And uh, I got exactly what I wanted. Of course, I don't know if these work yet or anything else, but uh, we could, uh, at this point, I'm sorely tempted to say, fine, I got what I wanted. Let's. Uh, install one of these drives in the Pentium PC and start making lots of uh, uh, TRS-80 images. But uh, no, that uh, I don't think so. We got a co complete machine over here. Let's at least see if this machine, if it works, what it does and what it even is.
Now, all right, the big moment has arrived. I've put a power cord in, and uh, let's power it up. As I said before, there's no need or there's no use in us bringing this up on a variac because uh, because it was most likely very recently already powered up. So here it goes. So I can hear the hard drive seeking. Well, I don't know if it's seeking, but I can hear the stepper motor doing something. Oh, the light went on, but not the light from the controller. And, okay, it's looking for an OS. It did a seek on this drive. Then it did something over here. Well, of course now you're telling me, well, don't be an idiot. I mean, uh, hook up a monitor, hook up a keyboard, see what it outputs. And uh, that's basically where the uh, first problem comes into play. This needs a CGA monitor. I do not have a CGA monitor. It also needs an XT keyboard, but I have several keyboards with uh, PS2 connectors and uh, this has the uh, DIN type plug. So I can uh, just plug it into the connector and plug this into the back. But uh, let's take things slowly. The next thing I need to do is to uh, find a way to put a display on this. Now, I did a few episodes on uh, repairing Atari Arcade uh, PCBs and uh, those era PCBs all generated uh, RGB signals. So you got your RGB value, horizontal sync, vertical sync and ground. And uh, I did not have an RGB monitor at the time, but after doing a lot of reading, I found that uh, the NEC Multisync LCD 1970VX, uh, which I was uh, fortunate enough to find an example of, actually will, it has a VGA input on the back, but if you connect the RGB and the sinks and everything else, it will actually sync to the signal coming out and we could clearly see the output of the Atari board. So uh, CGA is RGB. The difference being that the RGB signals are are digital. So that's why you can why you can get a total of eight colors out of CGA because the RGB lines are either zero or five volts. That also poses a problem because a lot of other monitors, aside from the fact that they can sync on 15 kilohertz or uh, 17 or 18, whatever it is that this one generates, it's a little higher than 15 because you can get 80 columns out of it. But uh, they, I think, expect a signal between 0 and 3.7 volts or something like that. And if you give it full blast 5 volt signals on RGB, they don't like that at all, and some of them may even get damaged. However, the, uh, this particular monitor is supposed to be tolerant of that and show you the signals. Now, of course, how do we hook it up? Well, the same way we hooked it up before, and uh, that is, we have a VGA plug that is wired into a terminal block and uh, the other end of the terminal block I wired to an RS-232 male cable uh, respecting the uh, signal flow of course so my idea is let's plug all of this in and uh, see if at least we can we can see an image come up on the screen and what it's going to tell us about the machine now promise to see what's in there and we will go and look at a little bit more in detail but this is probably important. I peeked in there and this is essentially a PCXT clone. There's a 40 pin 8088 sitting in there uh, right next to an empty 8087 socket so yes this is a clone of the original 
IBM PC. All right, we're plugged in. Let's see. Oh. <coughs> Keyboard error. Well, no shit. Uh, it's fully loaded with 640K of non-parity RAM. And uh, so it looked like it pinged the hard drive. Oh, well, it's pinging the floppy, pinging the hard drive. And then it conveniently clears the screen for us by scrolling everything up. And uh, we can sit here and wait and wait and wait and wait. And uh, nothing else happens. So uh, what we need next is, well at least the drive seems to be doing something. We need to create an image, a do an MS-DOS image, and see, make a system disk, and see if this will at least boot off of the uh, system disk. I spared you the uh, footage of making a system disk, because essentially what I did, I took this top drive out, and installed it in my Pentium PC. Uh, made sure that the BIOS knew that this was a 360K drive and then created a DOS 622 system disk on it. Which is right here. So, let's see if the machine can bootstrap from this. Still the keyboard error, copyright 1986, stepper in the hard drive is uh, doing stuff, but not being very successful at it. And after a while it should start reading, yes, it's stepping the head. Ah, well, so far we know that uh, this drive is good, the video card is good, power supply is good, and obviously the processor board memory are good, so uh, that's actually pretty impressive that uh, a lot of the stuff works. Of course now, uh, it's waiting for me to hit enter on the date. So I'm hitting my imaginary keyboard over here, but uh, I guess my powers of suggestion aren't good enough. So let's get a keyboard. And as I mentioned before, using a PS2 to DIN adapter, let's see if at least we can get a, uh, an enter command into this and see if it continues the boot process. So I found a uh, keyboard. It's a Sony keyboard with a PS2 connector that I uh, plugged into the back. And this is kind of really cool because it's got an internet button. What do you think? Is it going to work? Well, let's find out. So, back we go. It gave us a keyboard error again. And, uh, can't get the caps lock or anything else to come up here. Well, let's wait till it actually asks, waits for keyboard input and see uh, if any of that does something for us. But that's usually a bad sign if you can't even get caps lock to light up. It's almost like it's not getting any power. Another thing, of course, is that these early keyboards waited for a uh, for some sort of a break signal to come from the processor before they woke up and did anything. And if it doesn't get the break signal, it doesn't do anything. So, drum roll, please. Enter key. Nothing. Well, 
Well, that's no good. All right. Uh, looks like I'm getting old and forgetful, but uh, it's not as easy as using one of these converters. It turns out that most of the keyboards that you can buy that have a PS2 connector on it are actually AT, IBM AT compatible and not IBM XT compatible. Uh, it turns out that those two keyboards had different uh, had the different key codes that they sent out and I think the, the COM protocol was actually different. So that's why we're getting nothing coming out of here. Of course again uh, I went to eBay to plop down my $5 plus 1995 shipping to get an IBM XT keyboard, but no! Uh, original ones run well over $100, PC XT keyboards, and during that time a lot of clone keyboards were made that actually had a switch on the back uh, where you could switch in between XT and AT, I didn't actually find any clone keyboards specifically made for the XT, but uh, the uh, the switchable keyboards were also hundred dollars and up. And uh, again, that's that's kind of a little bit too much. So what I did was, of course, first of all, beating my chest, I was going to throw an arm at this problem and essentially do protocol conversion between the keyboard and the computer. But uh, uh, I've uh, in the past few years I've learned my lesson and I no longer try to reinvent the wheel and uh, after checking around for a while uh, a, uh, a smart fellow actually figured out how to do this utilizing an Arduino. The reason it looks this horrible is when I first saw the whole thing uh, I had my doubts that it may work and I wasn't gonna go and spend a few hours you know putting together a neat board and all of that uh, it is. Uh, the Arduino sketch was basically available. You just hooked it up to the uh, Arduino UI and downloaded the sketch. Now it did have a test mode built in and by the way I am going to, the link is included uh, in the description right underneath here. So if you want to build your own please go there and uh, credit has been given to the original creator for this. And uh, the neat thing was that when you got the Arduino hooked up to your main computer, if you set the uh, define the debug flag uh, through the serial connection on the Arduino IDE, you can actually see it work or not work. And I hooked it up and it started sending codes out. So the part that intercepted what came out of this keyboard worked, but of course the next part was to create the uh, input for the PC, which is a DIN plug and uh, connected with two lines plus ground of course to the uh, to the Arduino. So let me plug this thing in without ripping out all of the uh, clips I have on there and uh, see if it, see if it'll actually output uh, something that this machine can interpret. And here we are, nothing seems to be shorting. And uh, oh, I do need to add power. I guess I could power I could power the Arduino off the 5 volt line coming out of the computer, but for now uh, to get rid of yet another unknown, let's just hook up hook up the Arduino to 9 volts DC. And let's see if we get some blinking lights on the Arduino. I'm afraid to pick this up more to show you, so you can't see it, but let's see. Got some flashes, power light is on, and the yellow light is on. So I guess this thing is working now. Well, here we go again. Can't wait to get the hard disk fixed in this so we don't have to sit through the uh, floppy boot all the time. Well, no keyboard error this time. So it did talk to it. Oh, num lock works. Caps lock work. Where is scroll lock? 
Hmm. Okay. Come on, boot up so I can hit the internet button and uh, Okay, and now uh, drum roll again. That drum's really worn out by now, but uh, ha, I took it. Okay, we are in DOS. So uh, I just can't help myself. I gotta hit the internet button, see what happens. Absolutely nothing. So, uh, okay, that was a good while it lasted. Now, while I was at it, I made two DOS disks. So, first thing to test is is drive B functional. Yes it is. And what do we have? I have a few other things on drive A that we are probably going to need, part part of DOS. But that's good. Second drive is also functional. And now of course the uh, hard drive should be sitting at C. So now, uh, invalid drive. So it doesn't even see the C drive. Let me turn it over so you can actually see at least the indicator in front. Because when I did a C directory, I don't think it lit up. And it didn't. So, uh, first thing to do is, I mean, this, this has been sitting for many, many, many years. And you heard my rant about magnetic media going bad after all this time. And after all, the hard drive also has magnetic media in it. So, uh, let's run the uh, disk partition utility. Because sometimes when things aren't partitioned, error reading fixed disk. Hmm. So uh, if F disk doesn't work, there really isn't a whole lot else you can do other than uh, trying to figure out it probably needs something called a low level format. And uh, let me figure out how to do a low level format on this thing because uh, one other thing that's happening is I can't enter, I tried this to enter BIOS and reading online it says that the DTK systems require you to hold down the escape key when booting to enter BIOS but the uh, problem is that's one of the keys that I don't think is working properly through this interface because it gives us a slash and an enter. So I can probably stand there all day long rebooting it and holding the escape key but since it's not sending out the right code I can't enter BIOS so uh, what do we do about this all right I refreshed my memory and uh, basically the uh, low level format routine for the hard disk is contained uh, on the uh, hard disk controller which is uh, this guy over here and uh, there's a ROM, there's an EEPROM on there and uh, for those of you who need a refresher the architecture of the uh, 8088 is that it has a 1 megabyte uh, address space and the lower 640k are used for RAM which we saw this has at the very top is the uh, BIOS ROM that sits on the motherboard and in between the si end of 640 and uh, the start of BIOS ROM or system ROM we have IO space and more BIOS space which is occupied by uh, certain uh, expansion cards that actually need uh, or supply their own BIOS ROM extensions and in the case of the hard disk controller, 
it has all of the hard disk control uh, routines in there and it also has the uh, low level format routine so uh, and the way we get in there is we need to use the DOS debug program and uh, the let's see the uh, routine the entry point for the format routine is at uh, segment C800 offset 5 and I just want to have a look at this and see if there's actually something there there's a jump instruction there and uh, so I guess we could also look at C800 B50 and there should be valid code there and it jumps again and we can probably play this game all day long. There's some data under here because you see the disassembly goes bad. So let's have a look at C800. Oh, B57. Did I do that right? And yet another jam jump. And all right. Uh, it looks like there's valid code there, so uh, let's go ahead and see if we can format the hard drive now. And the way we jump there is use the go command, oh, go is equal to, how'd that work, oh, C800 at, not C8000, C800 at offset 5. And we enter the Super BIOS format of Ref 2.4, blah blah, copyright Western Digital. Current drive is C. Select new drive or return for current. So at least it knows that there is a drive C in here. Current interleave is 4. Select new interleave or return. I have no idea what the interleave is supposed to be, so I will use the default. Are you dynamically configuring the drive? Uh, mm, I'm going to say no because I have no idea how to dynamically configure it. And uh, press yes to begin formatting drive with interleave 4. Yes. Enter. I can hear the drive stepping. Which is probably hard for you to hear over the uh, noise of the fan. But the uh, drive select light is on. The one on the drive, I mean the one on the front panel is still not coming on. But uh, this is probably going to take a while, so uh, go and get yourself a sandwich, cup of coffee, run around the house, whatever. And, uh, no, actually I'm supposed to do that. You can just sit down and you will be instantly transformed to the results of the format operation. Okay, this took about just under 10 minutes. Remember, it's a 38 meg drive. Do you want to format bad tracks? And I don't know exactly what it means, but the drive, I think, has from the factory an embedded list of bad tracks and co uh, written to the disk somewhere. And the format program was able to retrieve those and it probably avoided them. But now it's giving us an override and that doesn't seem like a really good idea. So, I'm going to say no, and that's it. Now, another thing I found while I was waiting for this thing to format was it bugged me to no end that the front panel hard drive light wouldn't come on, and uh, I found the problem. There's a connector right in the middle of the picture. Let's see how close I can get to it. This basically drives the LED on the front panel and it was plugged in wrong. Uh, it was plugged in left, left to right and assuming that the uh, 
red, uh, the red wire is positive and this is negative, looking at the card looked like there's positive voltage coming out of this side and uh, the LED wouldn't light up with reverse polarity. So uh, at this point that works too. So let's go out and uh, press any key when ready and uh, play really pay really close attention of course to the uh, hard drive light. All right I'm looking for the any key now which I can't find so I'll just hit enter. And uh, waiting, 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 waiting. Come on, there you go. And the LED now lights up. And that's actually really good because I don't know if you remember, but the front panel totally obscures this. So you actually, without this LED, you have no idea whether the hard drive is getting accessed or not. So I was trying to read that drive, but there isn't anything on the hard drive right now. So uh, it's just sitting there, trying and trying. I can hear it seeking. And uh, mercifully it gives up. And uh, goes and boots from the floppy. So now what we're going to do next, of course, is see if at least drive C has become a valid drive in this system now, which is the first step to, uh, to getting the hard drive up and running. And uh, I know to, to some of you may not think it's a big deal, but I, I think it is a big deal because this is an ancient MFM drive. And uh, since it was completely dead, which probably means it was either mishandled during shipping or or it just sat there for too long and the heads got stuck to the platters or whatever, but the, that doesn't seem to be the case because at least the low-level format didn't complain. So, if we run a directory, it still says the invalid drive spec. Oh, okay. But not all is lost because that is probably because we have an F disk this. Now, for most modern drive, you can't low-level format them because all that, that's done. All those smarts are on the drive itself. It formats itself. It uh, circumvents bad tracks and uses extra tracks and all of that stuff. You have no control over that anymore. But uh, on this one, uh, yeah, we had to low-level format it. The next one is to partition the disk. And uh, some of you may be familiar with F disk. Even though nowadays when you get a drive, it's plug and play. You put it into your system and it just, it's there. It's a Win 10 formatted drive or whatever and everything's fine. But in this case, what we want to do is, uh, well, let's look at the partition information. There shouldn't be anything. But it does see the current fixed drive. Well, well, that's the one it's going to work on. But there are no partitions. So we get out of here and say create a DOS partition. And what we want to do is create a primary DOS partition because that's what it's going to boot off of. And we do this and it sits there. And do we want to use the maximum available space? Yes, I don't think we've hit DOS limits with 38 megs. So we are just going to make a single partition and make that partition active. And again, that wants to reboot. Well, now this time at least we should see, I mean, when we run a directory on it, we shouldn't be seeing anything, but because uh, there isn't anything on the drive, but at least it shouldn't say that it can't find the drive. So, yes, the drive is there, but nobody's home. And it should recognize that fact. We're getting closer, guys. Don't get impatient. I know this gets a little bit boring, but just, just be excited about this old technology uh, getting bootstrapped back to life. 
And then again, if you didn't find any of this exciting, then you're probably watching a channel on, on celebrity watching or whatever. But the, this is more fun and more educational. So that's good. And now, yet again, invalid me. Of course, it's an invalid media type. See, I keep jumping ahead of myself. There is a third step involved, and that is very good. We need to format the drive. So let's not just format the drive, but put the system on it too. So after this step, we should be able to boot from the hard drive, if of course everything is okay. So we're going to give it the uh, slash U option, which means unconditional. No, actually I'm not going to give it the unconditional, because that means it will it'll reformat without checking if there's anything on the drive. I'm just going to say slash S, which means put the system on it. Boy, that, that's a big program. Okay, all data on non-removable disk, drive C will be lost. Proceed with format, of course. Go. All right. Time for me to take a break. And uh, we'll be back soon. Okay, I don't want you to miss any of the fun. Looks like we're almost there. Ooh, timed that just right. So now it's going to write the uh, system to the drive, fix up the boot sector and everything. At least I hope system transferred. Okay, so here's a big question. What are we going to call this? And uh, what did you say? All right, that's, that's a good name. I'm basically going to call it the uh, Staubsauger, which means vacuum cleaner. In German, an app name because this thing sounds like a vacuum cleaner. So, And we're back. And uh, one thing we can run on this is the check disk utility. It's not exhaustive, but uh, we'll kind of do a quick check of the hard drive. Oh, I, I ran it on the floppy. I need to tell it to check this. See. And there you go, it's accessing, looking at the drive. And here are the results. We have a grand total of uh, 32 megs and change. And uh, gives us our system memory. Oh, it's system memory. For a minute there I was hesitating because it said that's bytes free. I thought it was referring to the uh, to the disk, but that's actually system memory available. It's got 600k system memory available and uh, 32 megs and some on the disk. And finally, 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 we are at the last step, the last software step, and that is to see can we now boot off of the hard drive. So let's take out the floppy. And reboot. And uh, what do you think? It's going to boot off the drive? I say yes it is. I mean, you know, one thing was that IBM, you know, was a little bit not 
state-of-the-art when they built this thing or wrote the biases or whatever but they were pretty thorough and uh, and there you go it's loading the system off of the hard drive and there you go we got a functional XT with two good floppies and a really good HD so here's the inside thought you might find it interesting what the motherboard looks like if you, if you haven't looked at one lately but uh, this is about it we got eight expansion slots we have a 30 meg and a 14.318 meg crystal mounted over here buffering the 8088 socketed and uh, it's uh, marked SAB8088-1 which means this is actually a second source of the Intel chip and uh, the SAB stands for uh, I think that's Siemens who manufactured this it's got an 8087 socket right next to it and uh, I guess when you fill that up you have to hit one of these dip switches over here to activate it or let the processor know it's there glue logic over here curiously enough a 74 LS 322 that's socketed that's a counter shift register combo but I don't know why they socketed it must have had bad experience with the longevity of this thing uh, an 82 55. Am I seeing that right? Yeah, an 8255, which is just a PIO chip with, uh, what is it, 1624 IO pins on it. Then we have a uh, 8237, which is a DMA controller. Here's the actual BIOS ROM on it, which is a 2764. Boy, they really didn't need a lot of space to... Uh, to put the OS in and of course the 88 uh, the 8088 is the uh, amputated version of the 8086 in that it only has an 8-bit external data bus and I guess that's why how they can get away with just a single EEPROM. Now, I haven't seen the schematics of it but it would be interesting to see that does this thing I mean have they implemented an actual 16-bit data bus and you can just put two EEPROMs in here for faster speed? Probably not. That's probably for expansion purposes. And uh, what else do we have? We have an 82.59 and an 82.53. This one is a triple timer. Not exactly sure what that is right now. But then the only thing remaining is our array of RAM. We have two sets of eight uh, 256 by one dynamic RAMs, and then we have two sets of uh, what is that number? TMS something or other, and these are uh, 64k by four RAMs. So the whole thing adds up to 640k, and that's about all she wrote for the inside. And a quick look at some of the cards I removed. Uh, here's a multifunction card that has the uh, floppy connector over here. Uh, and it looks like a, uh, I think we looked at it, a serial port, a parallel port. And it also has a an expansion connector. Where'd that go? Oh, over here. Which... Uh, I don't know. Is that that? That's like a, a game, uh, a joystick interface. Probably not. Probably doesn't have MIDI because MIDI wasn't born yet. But in most newer ones, you see these connectors. Uh, they are. They also double as MIDI connectors and uh, as well as joystick interfaces. Interesting thing is this has a battery on it, so this has a real-time clock. Of course I measured the battery and it is nearly dead. So I'm going to have to replace this but I do know that I have to put something into the auto exec batch file uh, that's going to go ahead and read the time here so it doesn't come off come on with that annoying prompt every time you boot up. 
also of interest is this card, this card which is the hard, the the uh, fixed disk driver, and uh, it's kind of funny because there's really no markings on here identifying the card, but uh, the pro all of the chips here are marked WDC, so it's obviously an OEM Western Digital card. It's got some Sony RAM on it too, and. Uh, so that's what drives that. Let's see. The other stuff isn't really that interesting. There's a modem. Here's this card with that, which I identified as a Mac looking like a connector. And it's it says that this is a scanner interface board. So, well, somebody must have digitized documents with this thing. And next to it was another one, this one, which also has that connector on it. It's again not identified as to what it is, but it has a bunch of decoding logic on it and an 8255, so essentially it's it's generating parallel data for something or other here. Uh, I don't know why you would need the 24 I.O. bits when this thing only has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight pins coming out, but uh, I don't know. It's kind of hard to look these things up when they don't even give you a model number on it, but uh, eventually I'll find what it is, but I doubt that this is something very useful. And finally, here is our expert, Top Sega 800, version 3.05, licensed by Genoa. So it's a general graphics card, and uh, it has, of course, the CGI output. Did I say CGI? CGA output, and uh, I think one of these, I think I read that somewhere, that one of these is actually a, uh, a composite video output, and the other one, uh, I don't know what the other one is. But here's the graphics card, and it has a grand total of 64K by 1s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It has 64K of onboard video RAM. So there you go. So let's put this thing back together again and see if we can actually see if it still runs, if I can put it back into the shape that it, into the state that it was on before I ripped it apart. And oh, forgot the most important part, of course. Here is the ST238R. Let's, uh, oh, I can't pull it out anymore, but, well, you pretty much saw it already. Heavy bastard. Consumes 1.7 amps and uh, has a list of bad tracks here. That's probably what is somehow written on the inside of it, which the uh, which the uh, low-level formatter was able to read, and then it asked me, hey, should I try to format those? Didn't sound like a real good idea at the time, and I still don't think it is. But let's put it back together. Okay, I got it put back together. Everything still worked. I plugged things in right. Uh, so let's check and see what horizontal frequency it's running at. And it's telling us here that we are at 21.8 kilohertz. That's what the monitor is detecting. And again, that's uh, on uh, the Atari games, it was running at uh, 15,400 or so horizontal, 240 pixels. And this one has a higher frequency because it is set up as a, uh, it needs to display 80 characters, 80 columns uh, on the screen. Other than that, uh, one uh, somewhat annoying part of the uh, case was it had this real old musty smell. And... Uh, so I figured I'm going to have to take this thing, completely strip this thing, and clean up every single uh, exposed surface with, uh, with some sort of a cleaner. 
because you can put dryer sheets inside of this and leave it closed and uh, that'll work for a day or two and then uh, but it doesn't remove the source of the smell but I lucked out because I spent some time actually cleaning the outer case with uh, with the window cleaner several times and uh, the smell has all but disappeared so the source of the smell was sitting on the outside of this thing. There's still some rust over here which I'm going to have to get off and uh, some more marker residue. But that's about it. Other things that remain open and I got to decide is we obviously have uh, the Arduino board here functioning as a uh, protocol converter for the keyboard. I can't move all of that onto something simple like this. Plug just the Arduino chip in here. Put a clock on it. I have a TTL clock right now because I don't really, I don't have a crystal oscillator at 16 meg. And then run the wires into both sides. And it's still not a great solution. You're, it's still kind of a Franken interface and. Uh, I'm probably going to spend some time to see if I can pick up an XT keyboard which would make things uh, much neater. Other than that I'll just have a look around and see if I can come across any software written for an XT. Some more utilities to check the drive more in depth and make sure uh, that the drive will actually exercise the drive to see if it's going to last maybe some memory utilities that do more in-depth checking of the memory but as you saw everything's socketed with off-the-shelf chips so uh, finding memory errors I mean fixing memory errors or replacing chips should be easy I hope you enjoyed this walk down memory lane as a point of interest uh, I uh, bought an original IBM PC with two floppies and a display, no hard drive. Uh, sometime in 1982, uh, the machine cost me over $3,000, which is about $7,000 in today's money. And uh, things have changed, uh, prices have obviously changed greatly since then. And uh, I wish I still had my original machine. It did get a lot of use and it did pay for itself very quickly because there was a huge demand for IBM PC software at the time and uh, also in the emerging game market for the PC. So we're done finally and I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you find one of these don't throw them away they came back. I mean this was supposed to be a repair video but there was nothing to repair. All we really did was uh, reinitialize the hard drive and everything else works even though it's a clone it's of really good quality and things still work on it so uh, make sure uh, to subscribe maybe a thumbs up and by all means leave me leave me a comment or two love to hear from you guys I read them all see you later